The most dominant power in the lands between in the modern era is a body known as the Golden Order. This is not only a philosophy, but a state of the physical Elden Ring itself, and for all intents and purposes, is the governing order of the Erd Tree. Championed by the likes of Radigan, the second Elden Lord, the Golden Order enjoyed an unchallenged rule for years, with its adherents being both scholarly and fanatical. Yet it still collapsed. The Elden Ring was shattered, and the lands between were plunged into a period of calamity and conflict. If this ideology was so perfect, then how did this even come to pass? This was the question pondered by a scholar of unmatched renown and intelligence, Goldmask the Ever Brilliant. Goldmask would pose a simple yet powerful question. Why did the Golden Order fail? If the Golden Order was as holistic as its adherents claimed, how did it fail to prevent this great calamity? These questions go to the very core of what caused the shattering and how the world reached this pressure point in the first place. Through close attention to detail and a strong understanding of fundamentalism, we can learn how Goldmask, through his intense deliberations, identified glaring flaws within the Order. Viewing the Golden Order as a mathematical equation, Goldmask would seek to bring balance to this formula, much to the chagrin of Golden Order fanatics. This will be an extremely expansive video covering the creation of the Golden Order, the rise of Radigan, the fundamentalists, as well as taking a look at those unfortunate enough to fall outside the bounds established by the Golden Order. So join me this week as we examine the Golden Order, its many flaws, and the scholar who sought to perfect it. Before we get started guys, if you like Elden Ring lore, consider subscribing to the channel, as I almost exclusively produce long form lore content, and therefore there is plenty for you to sink your teeth into. So first of all, let us establish what do we mean by the Golden Order, and what does the term Order mean in this context? Going by Oxford Language's definition, Order is the arrangement or disposition of people or things in relation to each other, according to a particular sequence, pattern or method. It is critical to understand this right at the offset, because one of the main objectives Goldmask is trying to achieve is perfect order, and that is in fact the name of the age that we achieve if we use Goldmask's mending rune. To a degree, the golden order is actually a term that can refer to a couple of concepts. The first and most important is that it represents the current form, the physical form, of the Elden Ring, and it is from this version of the Elden Ring that the ideology Golden Order flows from. Indeed, the two fingers themselves confirm that the Elden Ring is the basis for the Golden Order, as well as offering us a commentary on the corruption of the Golden Order and why the land is in the state it is. For when we first claim a great rune, they say the following. Great Elden Ring, root of the Golden Order. Anchor of all lands, giver of grace, wellspring of all joy. Until it was shattered, the tragic corruption of the Order has taken its toll. Across the realm, life lies in ruin, fallen to pieces. Foul curses and misery spread, unabating. So two interesting points here. First of all is what I said before the quote, that indeed the Elden Ring in this form is the foundation of the Golden Order. And number two, it shows that even the Greater Will is aware of a corruption within the Golden Order that has led to this state of calamity. As we will see in the concluding chapter of this video, I believe it is the actions of the Vassal Gods, i.e. Marika and Radigan, that Goldmask wants to have removed, rather than the Greater Will itself. As we can see here, even the Greater Will seems frustrated by the actions of its vassals. 
Queen Marika is the vessel of the Elden Ring, carrier of its vision. A god in truth. But after the Elden Ring's shattering, she was imprisoned in the Erd Tree. A grim punishment for shattering the Order. Despite her godhood, Speak. Marika's trespass demanded a heavy sentence. But even in shackles, she remains a god and a vision's vessel. Regardless, it backs up our understanding of the Golden Order. It is a grouping of fundamental rules and principles that fit within the concept of the Golden Order, a concept based on this current form of the Elden Ring. Before we go any further into this chapter, I would like to credit Last Protagonist and his excellent video on the Great Tree, Crucible and the Golden Order, for this video has greatly influenced some of the foundational ideas in this coming chapter, especially the ideas of death and later on the idea of aggression. So rather than referencing him at specific points, I wanted to make it clear from the outset that his video has had influence on some of these foundational ideas, so do me a favour and go and watch that video and give them some love. The rule of the Erd Tree was not always synonymous with the Golden Order. The Crucible, as the primordial form of the Erd Tree, was once the representative age of the Erd Tree, and was a period that celebrated diverse, blended together life. In fact, we learned that any vestiges of the Crucible were once linked to what is divine, something we learn from the Crucible Knot Talisman, which reads as follows. A vestige of the Crucible of Primordial Life, partially born of devolution, it was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but it is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. So this is interesting because it seems to imply that the Golden Order is a more advanced, sophisticated era of the Earth Tree, where chaotic life is no longer venerated. But in the earlier, more formative years of the rule of the Earth Tree, when Godfrey was Elden Lord, those of the Crucible were not as disdained as they are now, and in fact the Crucible Knights were even the renowned champions of Lord Godfrey himself. Something that we learn from the Crucible Axhelm, which reads, Helm of the Crucible Knights who served Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. Yet the ideals and perceptions of those who followed the Erd Tree would change form, alongside the Elden Ring's form changing itself. At some point, the Elden Ring had the Rune of Death removed from it, resulting in the new Deathless framework that we would come to know as the Golden Order. We learn of this event through Enea the Finger Reader, who says the following on the Golden Order's creation. The rune of death goes by two names. The other is destined death. The forbidden shadow plucked from the Golden Order upon its creation. So we therefore learn that the Golden Order was created when the rune of death was plucked from it. The rune being removed from the Elden Ring. Now I am sure many understand this, but as a foundational point to cover all bases, the term Rune, in regards to the Rune of Death, tells us that this was once part of the Greater Elden Ring, which is made up of runes. During our quest to become Elden Lord, we learn that fragments of the Elden Ring have been claimed by the demigods. These fragments are great runes. And when we choose to repair the Elden Ring, we can use one of three mending runes, runes that then become part of the Elden Ring. And understanding that the creation of the Golden Order is linked to the removal of the Rune of Death is absolutely key in understanding the flawed foundations that the Golden Order is built upon. We get this further clarified by the Mending Rune of the Death Prince, which reads as follows. The Golden Order was created by confining death and death. So death has been completely confined, meaning it is no longer part of the Elden Ring, and given the Elden Ring 
is what governs the forces of this world, death becomes absent from the world. So that is fine and well, yet if the Elden Ring was once a power that included death, when exactly was the Rune of Death removed from the Elden Ring and why? Well, it seems to track back to an event we discuss a lot on this channel, the Godskin Apostasy. Prior to this, death indiscriminate was still a power in the world. People lived and people died. And we can see this by the fact that death is wielded freely by the Godskin Apostles. A fact that we learn from the Scouring Black Flame incantation, which reads as follows. The Black Flame could once slay gods, but when Malekith sealed destined death, the true power of the Black Flame was lost. So at this stage, the world was not deathless as it is now, and the godskins had the power to slay the gods by channeling death, the rune of death, through the Black Flame. And so, as an answer for this threat, Marika turned to Malekith, as we learn from Malekith's remembrance Marika's sole use of her shadow bound was to confine death and death. And so Malekith sealed the rune of death. Specifically, we learn that Malekith sealed death and death after the defeat of the Godskin Apostles, something we learn from the Godskin Apostles set, which reads the following. The Apostles, once said to serve death and death, are wielders of the godslaying Black Flame. But after their defeat by Malekith, the Black Blade, the source of their power was sealed away, meaning that Malekith defeated the Godskins and their Queen, and it was after this defeat that he sealed the Rune of Death. However, the power of death was now absent in the Lands Between, and this is why Malekith is so feared, because he is the only one that can now bring true death through his Black Blade, and of course this earns him a very fearsome reputation, something we learn from the description of his armour, which reads, Malekith, Queen Marika's loyal half-brother, bore a blade imbued with death and death, and there was not one demigod who did not fear him. Malekith has kept death out of the world at large since this godskin event, and is only reintroduced or unbound via the actions of the player character. The motivations of creating this new Elden Ring, and therefore this new order, in Marika's respect, for me is quite straightforward. I believe that she does it out of fear of the Godskin movement. However, I believe it is Radigan, her second husband, who goes on to further codify and cement the power of this new age through fundamentalism, a subject we will tackle shortly. So the world would enter a deathless state of endless life, where life was bound and recycled through the Erd Tree. The endless nature of life is best illustrated by the pathetic wandering nobles who wear the old aristocrat set, which reads as follows. Abandoning their birthplace after the shattering, these undead wanderers are the pitiful product of unending life. The fact that nobody ever dies, and in fact they all live long lives, explains why most people that we meet in game are shriveled zombie-like shells with grey skin. They have lived far too long without death, forced to wander and never die. No wonder Melina thinks this world needs some death. I speculate this is why death, quote unquote, in this world is tied to an Erdtree burial, where one doesn't die in the traditional sense, but is instead absorbed by the Erdtree to rejoin the cycle of endless life. Consider Rena's first dialogue with us regarding spirit ashes. She says, "'Tis a bell for calling forth spirits. Summon them with it. From ash and return to the Erdtree, the spirits will obey thine command but briefly, as they recall battles past." Even in these burnt ashes are the remains of a restless spirit that can't truly die. The deathless version of the Elden Ring is the foundation of the Golden Order as we know it today, Marika's decision to have Malekith seal the Rune of Death being the pivotal event that led to the Golden Order's creation. I wanted to cover this in detail, because I believe it is a foundational concept for one of the flaws identified by Goldmask as a factor in the Order's collapse. And if you consider that, 
it means that the very foundations, the very creations of the Golden Order meant that it was always destined to fall. It was just a matter of time before the inherent flaw behind its creation led to its own destruction. So with that established, let us review the belief system and behaviour of those of the Golden Order and how it contributed to the system's downfall. We learned that in the formative years of the Golden Order, the Order was not so intolerant of new ideas as it was developing itself. Roger tells us of one of the events in the earlier days of the Golden Order. The battle art you've learned is of the Glintstone family. They were conceived at the Great Academy of Rea Lucaria, to the north of this castle. In the past, they obeyed laws which contravened the Golden Order, or so I'm told. Fascinating, isn't it? That the Golden Order was pliable enough to absorb practices that contradicted itself in the past. With the Order broken, twisted, and in need of repair, such adaptability is more important now than ever. So it's fascinating that we can see that there was an acknowledgement of the fact that the practices and laws of the Glintstone Sorcerers fell outside the Golden Order at that stage. However, they were able to bring this in to their order and philosophies, and made it a part of it. Prior to this absorption, however, the Erdtree and Liarnian forces would of course go to war, and this is no surprise given A. We know the early years of the Erdtree were marked by conflict, where the forces of the Erdtree tried to enforce dominance by force over the lands between, and B. They were clearly different ideologies, which made them at odds with one another. It is from these conflicts that a champion, Radigan, a future leading member of the Golden Order, would arise. This is something we learn about from the Barrier of Gold incantation, which reads the following. This incantation was used by the champions of the Erdtree in the First and Second Liarnian Wars, during which the red-haired Radigan joined the hero's ranks. Yet despite the heroic feats of Radigan, the Carrion Knights were more than a match for the forces of the Erdtree, despite their very few numbers, with Lord Radigan's forces being unable to break them over two conflicts. It resulted in a stalemate, and eventually, instead of going to conflict a third time, the houses of the moon and the tree were joined in matrimony. It is here, at the Church of Vows, that the great houses of the Erd Tree and the moon were joined by the matrimonial bond between red-haired Radigan and Renala of the Full Moon. And so our church holds in view the monuments of both houses, the Erd Tree of the capital and the Academy of Rea Lucaria. As Roger says, instead of the Carrions and the Sorcerers being kept out of the Golden Order and being enemies forever, Lord Radigan repented his aggression and in fact brought them in to an alliance with the Erd Tree. I do think this is an important moment to consider because it is clear that Radigan is a central figure when it came to codifying a set of tenets of the Golden Order and establishing the ideas that would become fundamentalism. This is something told to us via the description of the Golden Order Greatsword, which reads, Greatsword made of light, modelled after the Elden Ring itself, forged by King Consort Radigan to proudly symbolise the tenets of the Golden Order. So Rogier speaks of the fluidity of the Golden Order in its formative days, where it accepted new ideas and new groupings of people into its order. But I believe it is this event that led Radigan to lay down the foundations of what would become the basis for the Golden Order tenants, based on the experiences he learned while still married to Renala before Godfrey was hounded from the lands between. As we will learn in a moment, a lot of Golden Fundamentalism scholarship is based around holism, a term coined by Brother Corin, a fundamentalist. The rhythms and calculus of the Master's finger betray a suspicion of the holism of the Golden Order. Used in this context, it means that Golden Order 
strives to be a order that defines, confines, and explains the entirety of life within one ideology. Such a deep and multi-layered concept is why the Golden Order seal refers to fundamentalism as scholarship in all but name. Fundamentalism, by definition, again from Oxford languages, is a form of religion that upholds a belief in the strict and literal interpretation of scripture. I think this is where a lot of people get confused at what they perceive to be a contradiction between scholarship and fundamentalism, as many see the latter to be fanatical religious hardliners that are as far removed from intellectualism as possible, when in fact, fundamentalists see themselves as scholars who analyse and scrutinise the very foundational texts of their religion far more than any other group, and thus they become more inflexible, unwilling to bend from the words of what they see to be the strict outlines of their orders. Part of the development of this modern golden order would be the acceptance and integration of intelligence-based practices, a movement spearheaded by Radigan himself based on his own life experience. We learn this from his talisman, which reads, As the husband of Renala of Caria, the red-haired Radigan studied sorcery, and as the husband of Queen Marika, he studied incantations. Thus did the hero aspire to be complete. So Lord Radigan was the pioneer of the fundamentalists that saw that sorcery and incantations should converge, converge into one practice that would become the Golden Order Fundamentalist Incantations. This is quite strictly linked to the Golden Order Law of Regression, in which outliers are pulled together to meet together in the mean, or converge. As Elden Lord, he clearly had time to ruminate on how the Deathless Golden Order should be governed and defined, and he blended his knowledge of the moon and the tree to make a new converged whole. This is the cornerstone of fundamentalism, as we learn from the Golden Order seal that scales with both intelligence and faith, a fact shared by the Golden Order incantations. All incantations developed directly by Radigan or his son Mikola, as we learn from the descriptions of Radigan's Rings of Light and the Discus of Light. Yet what are the tenets of these fundamentalists, the modern proprietors of the Golden Order, and what explains their tendency to favour incantations that draw both on intelligence and faith rather than dividing the two? It has to do with the two underpinning laws of fundamentalism that form the backbone of their ideologies, the law of regression and the law of causality. Now, as a principle, these are based on mathematical real-world concepts, which I find interesting because maths is referenced in-game in another place in respect of the Golden Order, and specifically I am referring to the pulley bow and the pulley crossbow, and for example, the pulley bow reads, longbow which utilises a series of pulleys and strings, the complex mechanism which required advanced mathematical and mechanical understanding to craft, was likely made by a certain genius who learned Golden Order fundamentalism. Now, I believe the genius mentioned in this description is Goldmask, though admittedly it could be any Golden Order scholar, given the Golden Order's connection to maths. But I think the fact that it's referred to a certain genius makes it Goldmask. I have no further proof of this other than it is what I believe. As we will see later, these oblique references to maths are not insignificant, because while we perceive the problems of the Golden Order as philosophical or moral, Goldmask views the Golden Order as an equation needing to be solved. But more on this later. Let us return to the fundamentalists underpinning the laws by examining the two descriptions of the relevant incantations, which I will read side by side for simplicity. The fundamentalists describe the golden order through the powers of regression and causality. Regression is the pool of meaning, that all things yearn to eternally converge. Causality is the pool between meanings, that which links all things in a chain of relation. 
Both miracles make sense in the way that they physically operate in the game. The law of regression regresses beings to their prior state, i.e. someone who has been poisoned is referring to a prior state where they did not have poison, and the law of causality incantation is simply an illustration of cause and effect. The aggression of your enemy is the cause of the damage that they receive. In totality, both of these laws posit that all things are connected and affect one another, and that they should seek to regress and converge to become the one through those connections. As we discussed earlier when Corin mentions holism, the Golden Order as an ideology seeks to be holistic that explains everything through the connections therein, and therefore these laws fit quite neatly into holism. The law of regression in particular is important in understanding why fundamentalists are intolerant of large diversity, and instead see their order as one that is converging, simple and clean, like twins who are in essence one person sharing one soul, or a ruling couple that share one body. Chaos and diversity is disdained, whereas uniformity is applauded. And returning to our discussion on incantations, it explains why fundamentalist incantations are balanced between faith and intelligence. They should not be different, they should be linked through causality and be regressing to one. After Radigan incorporated their beliefs and practices into the rule of the Erd Tree, he created a causal link between the two. To surmise, everything within the defined order of the Golden Order must be interlinked, connected, and everything within this order must be converging to become part of the greater whole, just as incantations and sorcery are pulled together to become one, everything else in the world must become uniform. Through uniformity and causality, there will be no disorder, there is only order. And in all honesty, it reminds me of Convergence from Dead Space. Just as the quote unquote dead are buried at the roots of the Great Tree, to become one with the Erd Tree again, returned to the whole, regressed to the Erd Tree. Just as the twins known as D have converged to become two beings of one soul, and just as Radigan and Marika have converged to become one being. This is Golden Order Totality. This is Order. But these laws only apply to those which fall within the boundaries of the Golden Order. Those that have broken the cycle of a deathless world, that have broken the cycle of convergence, are those known to us as those that live in death. And these are imperfections that cannot be allowed to exist at all. I serve the Golden Order, that I might put this crooked land to rights, following only the guidance of the Great Elden Ring. Those who live in death fall outside the principles of the Golden Order. Their mere existence sullies the guidance of gold, tainting its truth. And so it is, the vermin must be exterminated, down to the very last. As we hear quite plainly from D here, the entire reason that the hunters of the Golden Order exist, and why they abhor those who live in death, is because those who live in death are a problematic inconsistency that starkly reflect the flaws of the system. To the hunters, they also believe it is a problem to be fixed, that by weeding out death root, collecting it all, and returning it to Malekith, the source of the rune of death, the Golden Order can be repaired, when in reality, the only role that they play is one of distraction, by stoking hatred against those who live in death, the hunters only manage to help deflect blame from the Order and its leaders. When Rani and her co-conspirators stole a fragment of the Rune of Death and murdered Godwin, Deathroot spread throughout the world. This was not meant to happen in the eyes of the Golden Order, which was designed specifically as an order that had contained death, but here was death leaking out into a world that was unprepared for death. We have just learned in the previous chapter that Golden Order fundamentalists see their world as something interconnected that can be pulled together to become one, to become uniform, and thus we have order. 
Yet those who live in death exist outside of such rules. They just continue to exist, despite having died. The purity of the Golden Order's claim to holism is therefore challenged, and this is where the fanatical hunters come in. They are here to fix that problem permanently. Indeed we know that the hunters are tied directly to fundamentalism, from Order's Blade item description, which reads, One of the incantations of the Golden Order fundamentalists, used by hunters of those who live in death. The role of the hunters is to stamp out defiled reason, all for the perfection of the Golden Order. This item description is really interesting in describing what the purpose of hunters is, and how we view those who live in death. Defiled reason. What an interesting term. As we explore this chapter, you will soon realise that the reason those who live in death are so hated by those like D, as they are seen as the only reason that there isn't perfect order for the Golden Order. They are the reason it is being defiled. They are a tangible inconsistency with Golden Order tenants. They literally defile the reason the Golden Order seeks to purport, and thus they really call into question of the truth of Golden Order fundamentalism. Something that cannot stand instead of some self-introspection, we must of course destroy these flaws. This is an idea well explained by the Holy Water Grace item description, which reads, There is no place in the Golden Order for those who have exceeded life's bounds. These blemishes must be hunted down by the virtuous. So this is obviously interesting for a lot of reasons. We know that the Golden Order's boundaries are defined by a world that's deathless, and here we are having an item description talking about beings that have exceeded life's bounds, and therefore exceeded life as described by the holism of the Golden Order. These beings literally cannot exist by the definition of the Golden Order, thus they are blemishes of the Golden Order's truth. This is why the hunters like D are quite funny to me, because they're quite paradoxical. They're talking about truth and purity, yet at the same time admit there is impurity and untruth within the Golden Order. The hunters incorrectly believe that the Golden Order's truth can be restored by weeding out Deathroot. That is, they believe that by returning all the fragments of the stolen Rune of Death and returning it to Malekith, the bearer of the Rune of Death, death will once more be confined, and order will be restored. However, this is a fallacy, as released by Garank. When he has collected all of the Deathroot, he realises the damage has still been done. There are some bells you cannot unring. The quarantine of death has been broken, and it will never be undone, and as long as the Golden Order remains in place, this glitch in the system will continue to exist. And indeed, on Malekith's dead, he laments that the Golden Order cannot be restored, a truth he has come to realise. It is... it is all consumed. Still, I am not sated. Not nearly sated. America! Is this what it is? To sin? Will things never be the same again? <sighs> this eternal flaw at the foundational level is understood by the aloof gold mask, but cannot be fathomed by the spittle flecked hunters of the Golden Order, who only see the target in front of them. And indeed, Goldmask would see this reasoning as a simplistic, tribalistic interpretation of order, a futile attempt to enforce a broken order by creating more disorder to distract them from the truth. What is it you intend? To deny us and our ways, like the dogmatic brutes of the Golden Order? This is an opinion of Goldmask's that we learn from the Order Healing Incantation, where it details that Goldmask found their us versus them mentality of the hunters to be little more than a simplistic distillations of the foundations of order, and it cannot exist within a true order. And in fact, all the hunters seem to do is keep the flawed broken order in power, 
by setting up a right versus wrong paradigm. This does not actually seek to solve the problems faced by the Order, though I have no doubt the Hunters believe they are fixing the problem. The Hunters do also highlight another issue with fundamentalism as a whole, the inability to recognise or even consider there are any flaws, and this is the problem when you establish your tenets and order as holistic and perfect, because then at that point to accept there are problems is to accept the order doesn't work as a concept. But we see this fanatical adherence to the Golden Order's flawed principles in a couple of characters. Marika, who herself clearly became a cynic by the end, calls Radigan a leal hound, as if to mock him for his blind adherence to the tenets of a clearly broken system. Corrin, despite his deep respect for Goldmask as an intellectual, eventually goes insane and snaps, rather than accepting Goldmask's truth. Surrounded by such blind sycophancy, is it any surprise that Marika felt as trapped as she did? For whatever motivation, Queen Marika shattered the Elden Ring, following the chaos of the Night of the Black Knives, and it brought an epoch to a close. The Golden Order has failed, but how is it even possible? If it was so perfect and holistic, how did the Golden Order fail to stop the world collapsing? These are exactly the questions that would be examined by the learned scholar Goldmask, who came to the lands between not as a warrior with a sword, but as a philosopher with a brilliant mind. We have already discussed the fact that those who ascribe to fundamentalism are in part scholars, scholars who have heavily philosophised about the nature of their order and the Elden Ring in order to create strict outlines and boundaries. We know that Goldmask was such a scholar, as Brother Corin refers to him as such. There's something I should mention to you as well. I'm thinking of leaving the Round Table Hold. Do you know of the noble Goldmask? Though he was but a tarnished, living outside the lands between, he was a great scholar, who foresaw the coming guidance of grace, and now, I hear he has come to the lands between alone, to contemplate the Golden Order. I wish nothing more than to seek his instruction, and perhaps even help him in his research. To augment this, we learn from his gold mask, the item itself, that he is a staunch pursuer of fundamentalism, meaning he is a scholar dedicated to fundamentalism very loyally. And as we learn later, unlike his fellow conceited scholars, he is truly loyal in that he would seek to perfect it rather than pretend it was perfect the way it was. Goldmask is referred to in a number of ways, the ever brilliant, noble and lord Goldmask, and it shows that he was held in great esteem for his brilliant mind and keen understanding of the inner workings of the Golden Order and Elden Ring. That being said, I think it is clear we aren't meant to fully comprehend the intimate way in which Goldmask understands the form of the Elden Ring, as he perceives its formation in a more mathematical way than in a philosophical or practical way that we do. As I have already mentioned, the Golden Order has links to mathematics, and this is clearly the way in which Goldmask sees it, in my opinion. He sees the Golden Order through its shape, structure, and form. The mathematical nature of Goldmask's works is again reinforced by Corin, who refers to Goldmask's movements as a calculus. The Master's reflections had heightened as we neared the Erd Tree. While still a precise calculus, the rhythms grew increasingly wild. Even in the introductory cinematic of the game, Goldmask isn't writing a philosophical treatise, he is instead painting the form of the Elden Ring as it should be in order to represent an equation of order. Indeed, the very reason for Goldmask's questioning of the Golden Order and his reasoning for coming to the Lands Between is because he has foreseen the perfect form of the Elden Ring. He has seen this in a vision, and that vision is his mask's design itself and we learn of this through the mask's description, which reads as follows. 
a mask designed to resemble a blazing golden halo, created and left behind by Lord Goldmask, a staunch pursuer of Golden Order fundamentalism. Its striking design represents both the brilliant inspiration that once shone upon him, and the vision of a ring that he will surely find at the end of his pursuit. This vision of a perfect order would obviously lead him to ponder on why the current form of the Golden Order failed, what went wrong in the equation, and of course when he figures out the problem, he is able to produce this perfected equation that he saw in his vision. Goldmask's reputation is reinforced by the fact that he was so revered that he once had disciples, something we learn from his rags which read, bracelets made in the image of Erdtree branches, minimal adornments made by Goldmask's disciples. What should be clear to the player is that Goldmask obviously does not operate on the same plane of intelligence that we do. Goldmask does not speak, instead his mind is so focused elsewhere on the unpacking of the Golden Order's formula in a way we can never comprehend. We see this throughout Corrin's questline, he utters not a word, and only gestures in reference to his calculations. It is quite likely that this inhuman and frustrating behaviour is what led to his disciples to abandon him, not being able to communicate with him nor understand his bizarre behaviour. Either that, or it could be like Corrin, that these disciples realised that Goldmask did not agree with the perfection of the Golden Order, an idea that must be the same as blasphemy to the hardliners of the Golden Order. And yet this simply isn't true. His mask describes him as a staunch pursuer of Golden Order fundamentalism. It's just that Goldmask is so true to the idea of perfected order that he is willing to challenge the idea that the current order is not perfect. What we will see through the scope of this following chapter is something I heavily hinted at in the opening segment of this video. Goldmask would identify flaws in the perfection of the Golden Order, and I believe it is the recognition of such flaws that sets him head and shoulders above other delusional members of the Golden Order. D is a walking contradiction, calling the Golden Order perfect, yet at the same time acknowledging imperfection exists. And Goldmask doesn't seek to bring these flaws into the light to destroy the Golden Order as a concept. In fact, far the opposite. Goldmask seeks to truly have the perfect Golden Order, a Golden Order that represents the ideals behind it. And so with that in mind, I want us to analyse what Goldmask clearly saw as the flaws in the Golden Order. To be loyal to an idea is not to be enslaved to a dogmatic set of rules. No, it is to use your own life experience and wisdom to try and perfect and challenge the foundations of something you truly believe in to make sure that its ideals are actually upheld. As Kreia from Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2 says, To believe in an ideal is to be willing to betray it. It is something no Sith or Jedi has ever truly learned. So with that said, let us revisit the fundamental piece of evidence in this regard, the Order Healing Incantation, which reads as follows. The noble gold mask lamented what had become of the hunters. How easy is it? for learning and learnedness to be reduced to the ravings of fanatics. All the good and the great wanted, in their foolishness, was an absolute evil to contend with. Does such a notion exist in the fundamentals of order? So this is flaw number one, a flaw that goes back to the very concepts we discussed in the opening of this video. Order. Order, as we determined, is the unity of people, ideas and variables that together create an order. Yet by its very definition, an order defines itself by setting itself against another group that is not accepted to illustrate what is accepted, in order to define itself and in order to sustain its own power base. This is how Goldmask sees the Golden Order, and using Goldmask's Mending Rune at the end of the game will bring about a new age called the Age of Order, and given that it's created by Goldmask, I think it's clear that one of his motivations is to create a true order, order that is based on stability, not order that props itself up by fabricating an absolute 
evil. One of the things that clearly unsettles Goldmask about the current order is that there is actually no order. This golden order is a realm of chaos and disorder. And how can such a thing even exist within something that calls itself order? Yet this is merely a symptom observed by Goldmask. And when he comes to the lands between, we see that he begins operating on that higher plane and he starts to unwind the mathematical structure of the Golden Order. His thoughts and calculus expressed by his rhythms and gesturing that we see him doing. In the process of working through his formula, he gets to the core of the equation, but is frozen when he is presented with a variable he had not expected. The name Radigan. The Master's reflections had heightened as we neared the Erd Tree. While still a precise calculus, the rhythms grew increasingly wild until he simply ceased. Now the Master is facing quite the puzzle. The Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marika is the one true god. However, the name of Marika's second husband, King Consort Radigan, also appeared. Who exactly was Radigan? The Master is stumped. His finger has remained still ever since Radigan's name was discovered. Goldmask is missing part of the formula because the formula he has been given is based on a lie. And this is why we can see his right hand is frozen while his left is outstretched. He is missing half of the equation. It isn't until he is presented with the missing variable that he understands the formula completely and adopts the pose of golden order totality with both arms in equal balance. In my speculation, Golden Order Totality is representative of the truth that we bear witness to by casting the Law of Regression on Radigan's statue. The truth being that Marika is Radigan. That notion in itself is almost mathematical. Marika is equal to Radigan. But this is a revelation to Goldmask, as we hear him audibly gasp when we present him with this variable. As Corin has said, the Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marka is the one true God. That is the entire founding equation of this entire formula, and yet it is not true. So in a way, this entire institution, and therefore the form of the Elden Ring, is all built upon a lie. This understanding of Golden Order totality will govern the rest of Goldmask's journey. We see him in this pose in every subsequent meaning, in this pose that represents Marika and Radigan Rebus being the core of the Golden Order. And in time, he realises that this core must be extracted to reform the Elden Ring and reform the Perfect Order. So where does Goldmask go to next upon this revelation? He of course goes to the Mountains of Giants, to the Peak of Flame. At this stage, Corrin has begun to become very concerned, given A, the position of where they are, and the way in which he is reading the Master's calculations. I've been gripped by a terrifying thought. The rhythms and calculus of the Master's finger betray a suspicion of the holism of the Golden Order, a conceit. I am afraid, that cannot be overlooked. Oh, but how could this be? I dread to even entertain the possibility, but somehow I cannot cast aside my doubts about the Master. Tell me, have I simply lost my head? Only, if the Master were true to the Golden Order, why would he think to breach this forbidden mount of fire? He thinks there's something in these calculations that portrays a suspicion about the holism of the Golden Order. As we have already discussed, holism is the idea that the Golden Order explains and confines and controls everything. To him, the Golden Order, when viewed as the totality of its constituent parts, is fundamentally flawed, as the baseline equations of it are based on a lie. And part of his solution is implied by his journey to the Flame of Ruin. Why would the Master come here to the Forbidden Flame? the only purpose of which, surely, is to have the Erd Tree burnt down. Well, it is because he has come to the conclusion that the current gods must be destroyed for there to be true order. 
the Erd Tree must be destroyed. It is the vassal gods that are the flawed foundation of the current Golden Order, and with them excised, there can be true order. This is explained by the Mending Rune of the Perfect Order, which reads as follows. A rune of transcendental ideology, which will attempt to perfect the Golden Order. The current imperfection of the Golden Order, or instability of ideology, can be blamed upon the fickleness of gods no better than men. That is the fly in the ointment. So understanding what is actually said here is the critical moment in our assessment of Goldmask's actions and conclusion, and ultimately what went wrong with the Golden Order. The rune states that Goldmask's final conclusion is that there was a fickleness of the gods that has led to the instability of this ideology. This implies that the imperfections that we have reviewed, and the ones identified by Goldmask, can be traced back to the fickleness of the gods. It is hard to unpack, but ultimately it leads us to believe that Goldmask is blaming the problems of the Order at the feet of Marika and Radigan, and that the instability has come about through their own actions driven by human motivation. Goldmask seems to strike upon the truth when he realises Marika is equal to Radigan, meaning that this must be one of the reasons that he concludes the gods are fickle. Well, this is an example of the fickle nature of gods, as Corin says, The Golden Order is founded on the principle that Marika is the one true god. So the entire foundation of the Golden Order is built upon the truth that they have always known, that Marika is the one true god. And yet, the fickleness of the gods led them to completely usurp this truth through a union of Marika and Radigan. This is why Goldmask gets stuck on the calculations, as he is basing his formula of what they have always known to be the truth, only to later learn that gods have changed the rules. And indeed, one cannot help seeing Radigan's abandonment of his first wife, and so quickly marrying Marika, as nothing but fickle. With such foundational principles being upended, it is easy to see Marika Radigan as fickle. And he is right. Marika the one true god, meant to uphold the will of the Elden Ring, and the Erd Tree was in fact the one who destroyed it. And this is a remarkable transformation from Queen Marika, who led the battle against the giants, who said the following. In Marika's own words, Hark, brave warriors. Hark, my Lord Godfrey. We commend your deeds. Guidance hath delivered ye through each ordeal to the place ye stand. Put the giants to the sword, and confine the flame atop the mount. Let a new epoch begin, an epoch glistening with life. Brandish the Elden Ring, for the age of the Erd Tree. And then we have a transformation of someone who is clearly a champion and fervent believer in the Erd Tree, to the cynic who mocks Radigan for his blind faith. In Marika's own words... O oh, Radigan, leal hound of the Golden Order, thou art yet to become me. Thou art yet to become a god. Let us be shattered, both mine other self. We can see a real transformation of character here, from stalwart believer to jaded queen, from someone who waged war on behalf of the Earth Tree to someone who struck at its very heart. And while this might be an understandable transformation for a human, gods are meant to transcend the personal, and are meant to immutably represent their domains. They are meant to be better than us in this regard. For whatever reason, post Night of the Black Knives, Queen Marika is pushed to the brink, and ultimately makes the decision to shatter the Elden Ring, driven by her own motivations, whatever they may be, like a human. And indeed, the Rebus of Marika Radigan is itself a walking paradox by their very actions. On one hand, Marika drives the faith towards total oblivion, seeing its flaws in the Orders, and destroys the centre piece of the Order itself. Meanwhile, Radigan's fundamentalists are out denying that there's any flaws, and hunting down those who live in death. This is not even to mention the fact that it was Marika whose decision to remove the Rune of Death was what would lead to the loophole that would spawn 
those who live in death, and indeed their final actions are fickleness made manifest. One, Marika destroying the Elden Ring, while Radigan tries to repair it. It is these inconsistent actions and the cosmic consequences of such fickleness that Goldmask sees as the fly in the ointment. So with that said, let us look at the Mending Rune, his solution to perfect order. When we use any of the other two Mending Runes, they are incorporated into the Elden Ring, meaning the power of that rune becomes part of the New World Order, i.e. the Omen Curse, or those who live in death. However, with Gold Mask's rune, it is slightly different, and it is more like a halo that surrounds and encompasses the entirety of the Elden Ring. With the description of the Mending Rune in hand, the purpose of this should be made abundantly clear. It is a protective ring, shielding the Elden Ring from the influence of the gods. This is the vision that Gold Mask saw long ago, yet he only really understood what it was for when he found out the truth of the vassal gods of the Golden Order. Now beyond this, it is speculation and up to you and me to interpret this how we see fit. For me, I see the fact that the Elden Ring must still draw its power from the Greater Will, but it is now contained by Goldmask's halo, so it cannot be interfered by any vassal gods. This is why he comes to the Peak of Ruin. He too wishes to see its power unleashed, as the current vassal gods, Marika, Radigan, and the Elden Beast, must be cleansed for his perfected order to take its place. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I perceive the Greater Will to be something more than a basic god, and indeed the Greater Will also shows frustration at Marika for going off piste and not following the plan. Goldmask's rune is called the Mending Rune of the Perfect Order, and the age we can bring about is the Age of Order. Goldmask's motivations have been clearly laid out to us the entire course of this video. He believes the Golden Order should mean order, order and stability, no creaking and shifting foundations, and no personal motivations that can have cosmic consequences. Humans are humans at the end of the day. There will always be conflict and war to a degree, but when gods act the same way, there are cosmic consequences. When these gods harness the entire foundations of our existence to meet their own agendas, or if they destroy them in a moment of despair, then order is simply a lie. And this is the truth that Goldmask discovered. So thanks guys, that is my take on Goldmask and his attempts to repair the Golden Order. If you like this video, please remember to subscribe and give it a like as it helps the channel out immensely. If you want to support the channel in other ways, I have a Patreon and I also have channel memberships. But apart from that guys, leave me your comments below, let me know what you thought of the video and if you think I missed anything, as well as give me hints as to what you want me to cover next. But until next time guys, I will see you in the heart of the Erd Tree. Take care.